to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. Welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. I am your host, Mike Joke. I'm joining me this afternoon is none other than the number 26 driver for Andretti Auto Sport, Zach Veach. Zach, how are you doing, man? Yeah, man, I'm doing great. Just uh, trying to find ways to keep busy in these interesting times we, we find ourselves in. But luckily, uh, I got plenty to do at home. Uh, so we're, we're getting by. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's start with that. And I know we were, we were talking previously about that van. And this question comes from co-host Matt since he couldn't join. Uh, what progress have you been able to make on the Toastmaster 2500 during quarantine? And, and I have to add, how did you come up with the name? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. So um, for those that don't know, my, my girlfriend and I, we, um, at the end of the last season, we ended up buying a, uh, a ProMaster van because I, I've been wanting to basically buy a van and build it out to, to take out west when we're climbing and backpacking. And especially take it to the racetracks too, because you know I'm just I'm tired of sleeping in the dirt and cooking in the rain when we're out west when we don't need to be. So uh, we started on this project, and you know I was a little naive when we started because I thought, well, you know we build a full race car in two weeks, we should be able to build this thing in like two months. But we find ourselves on like month six or seven now, and we're we're about ninety percent done. So uh, luckily. When we came back from St. Pete, actually, um, you know, I was very antsy because my body just felt like we should be doing something. So we locked ourselves in a garage for two weeks and we really knocked out a lot of things that we needed to get done. And and now we're getting to the fun stuff. We're starting to do like the trimming and, you know, all the, the look nice stuff in the van. So I've uh, I really enjoyed that. That's awesome. Yeah, I am I'm not very handy with anything uh, outside of the occasional YouTube video to help me out. So how much of it has been a, a complete learning experience for you and how much has it just been your experience working on cars and, and various things growing up? Yeah, yeah, of course. And I'm sorry, I, I didn't answer how we, we got the name. I'll, I'll touch on that really quick. Uh, yeah. You know, we, we wanted to come up with a, a fun name for it because, you know, we wanted to have an Instagram for it. And uh, my girlfriend and I, it was like the fifth day we had the van. We started driving uh, down uh, a 74 east towards Cincinnati and the sun was going down. So this big shadow was behind, well, the sun was behind us casting a big shadow in front of us. And I was just driving. I was like, man, this thing looks like a giant toaster. Like, you know, cause the mirrors made it look like the little handle to flip the toast out of the toaster. And, and then we both kind of said at the same time that toast was like the perfect name. So that that's how we ended up getting the, the name for our van. But you know, a lot of this has been just learning as we go. Um, until I started this project, the only woodworking I'd done was building cutting boards for some friends just because I had a table saw and a planer. And, and you know, it's a lot different from what I knew. You know, growing up, I always worked on my own go-karts. That was kind of my deal with my dad that, you know, we shared the work because not only was it a great place for me in my life to learn, you know, how to drive and how to compete, but it was also a great time for me to learn how to work on things. So, you know, I, I felt really good working on metal and, and simple taking things apart, putting them back together, but creating a, a whole thing from scratch has been a monumental task. But luckily we have the internet and YouTube and, uh, you know, a lot of good friends that know a lot more than I do. So it's made it a fun uh, endeavor so far. <laughs> I can't, I can't wait to see it, uh, you know, in person and at some point when you're able to, camp at a racetrack so obviously we have to touch on i racing it's you know the the six weeks are, are are now done so what are your what were your thoughts on i racing on on how it evolved over six weeks and and, and we'll take it from there yeah it was interesting man <laughs> you know i think uh a lot of us when we got back from st pete there was some rumors but we were like ah, oh, there's no way they're gonna do an i racing league because, you know, half of us didn't have simulators and the world was basically shut down. So we're like, how are we going to get parts? So we put everything off a week, you know, when we got home, we were home for about a week. And I was like, ah, I don't think I need to order any of this stuff. Well, about three days after that thought, that's when we get the email. All of us were CC and said, hey, guys, we're, we're starting an racing league. And that's when my heart sank because I'm like, oh. <laughs> you know, it's 
that's a lot of money and a lot of things that you had to order within like a week to be ready for walking with Glenn. So my stuff didn't show up in time. So luckily, uh, Gabby Chavez let me use his sim for the Watkins Glen race. And then I had my stuff built for, uh, for Barber, but it was an experience, man. Uh, you know, the ovals I really enjoyed because it allowed us to fill in that, that gap of, uh, experience from, you know, the guys just learning how to sim race versus, you know, like Sage and Felix who have been doing it for, you know, six, seven years. So the ovals were a lot of fun but the road courses were definitely challenging. <laughs> yeah, they look very challenging just based on the way the, the cars and the tires seem to handle and slightly different from real life. Am I, am I close to accurate there? Oh, for sure. So, you know, the, the tough thing with that is in the race car, you have so many feeling receptors in your body that are telling you exactly what the race car is doing. So, you know, a lot of times you're not thinking about how to react to the car. You're just naturally reacting to what it needs. And on the ovals, you know, you don't really need a whole lot of, of that, that reception on iRacing to tell what you're doing right versus wrong. But on the road courses, you know, it's a lot like losing a sense. You know, it's like, uh, you know, missing one of those things that bring color into life. So, you know, it took a long time to try to reprogram everything else and get that feeling some other way. Totally fair there. So two more iRacing questions. One. Yeah. You got limited testing with the actual aero screen before the season didn't get underway. And <laughs> that included Coda, you know, a little bit at Sebring. Did iRacing help you get used to anything with the aero screen? I know obviously it, it can't you didn't get used to the cooling because you're in your in your you know <laughs> in your house, but any sight line yeah, help yeah. anything along those lines? You know, the the main thing was uh for us using iRacing with the windscreen, it was the first time that we got to see the race screen or the, the aero screen in race conditions. So, you know, even at testing, you might hit a bug or two and the crew guys would, you know, wipe it off when you came in. So it was never really an accumulation of debris on the screen. So during the iRacing events, you'd actually get a lot of rubber build up. So you're now looking through a very dirty aero screen so, you know, I think in a way that's going to be helpful because, you know, now we can kind of, you know, see how that's going to evolve through each race spin. So that was pretty realistic. Um, the only thing we all struggled with was the aero screen has that single pillar that comes down in the middle of it for uh, structural strength. And in real life, your eyes do a really good job. They have a ability to see around that post, basically, and blend it all into one one field of view really because you're looking you know 400 feet in front of the race car well in i racing that that pillar is still there but the screen's only a foot away from your face so there's no possible way to blend in what's happening in front of that pillar so i think a lot of uh, people would have seen us on the straightaways kind of swerving back and forth a little bit kind of like an old tail dragger in horde war ii because we just couldn't <laughs> see through that post right so you have to kind of like y'all the car so you can kind of like look out of the corner of your eye to see you know what was coming so that was the only thing that was a bit you know unrealistic but you know that's just a technology thing that has nothing to do with eye racing yeah totally fair there Make, makes a lot more sense thinking back on to, to what i saw but the last question <laughs> i am i'm sure you know what's coming is is the way indianapolis this past weekend unfolded if you had any thoughts on the festivities oh man it was <laughs> man when i i woke up uh was it sunday morning and i was just reading through all the articles of the destruction you know and and it was crazy i'm just happy i wasn't a part of it to be honest as far as any of the bad press um you know i i feel like a lot of europeans are upset at us oval racers over here because of the uh lando norris and simon pagino thing you know, that, that is what it is. I'm not going to touch it. The, the only thing I, I had the biggest issue with was, uh, you know, with uh, Santino and Oliver. You know, that, that was Oliver's race to win at that point. And, you know, Santino just just turned into him and took them both out. And it, it just ruined Oliver's shot for no reason. And, and to me, you know, that's just, that's just poor sportsmanship. You know, it's, you know when you're second. And being a man about it is, knowing when to accept your finishing second and 
you know, once you're in a straight line, you can't take out the leader to try to get in better, you know, better position. So I was just upset about that. You know, at the end of the day, I think a lot of us treated it a little less than real. And that's why we had some of the races that we had. But, you know, it's hard to get 33 people to have the same mindset on something, especially 33 guys that all have type A personality issues where we only think about ourselves. So, um, you know, it was an interesting race. I'm just glad that we ended on a high note. I mean, you know, we, we finished eighth. So we ended our iRacing championship uh, with a top 10 at Indianapolis. I, I can live with that. We'll, we'll take that to Texas and, and watch it not correlate at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I hope and fingers crossed that at least the media is, is allowed to travel down to Texas because I'm very curious to see how the, the vibe is in, in the paddock that weekend. Not that I really think too much will carry over, I'm, I'm, but I am curious. So... We will move on from iRacing there and talk a little bit about Team Andretti. So you're you're with Andretti Autosport now for a third season. You're with Gainbridge and Group 1001, I think, for a third or fourth year. So does that help your confidence going into a season with the continuity year over year? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm so lucky to have partners like Group 1001 and Gainbridge, specifically the CEO, Dan Towers. I mean... Dan, his this relationship started as just a, a local business guy giving me a shot to uh, try to compete in the Indy 500. And, and from that day four years ago, we've turned into a family. You know, I'm so thankful for Dan being in my life, just as a friend, not alone as a sponsor, um, just because he has been such a good person to me. And then you throw the opportunity in that he's given me to be an IndyCar driver. It's been... Uh, it's been something that I'll, I can never repay. And, you know, I'm so thankful to uh, be going into my third full season with uh, partners like them. And then Andretti Autosport as well. That team's been a home for, you know, nearly 10 years for me, um, you know, all the way from USF 2000 to IndyCar. So those guys, I mean, it's just, they're such a good team as far as the people that they have involved and, and they make doing your job, even when it's tough and serious, a ton of fun. You know, last year we kind of fell into that sophomore slump. And, you know, part of that was just me putting too much pressure on it, trying a little too hard. And, you know, uh, the engineer that I had, Garrett Mother, said he was my engineer in my first season and uh, most of my, my last season. And Garrett's a great guy, great engineer. I think we just had kind of a little bit of a different viewpoint on some things. And, and we just, we struggled getting the car right together, um, you know, throughout last year. So that, that's on, on both of us. So I, I'm really excited because towards the end of last year, uh, we made an engineering change to um, a great guy named Mark Bryant. He was Pato's engineer when he won the championship. And, and the main thing there is just Mark's a little bit younger and he's worked a lot with Indy Lights types of guys. And and guys that are still coming up and figuring things out. So, so Mark's really about kind of listening to what I need to be more comfortable, what I need to, you know, be able to push the car a little bit better. And, and so far we've had a great relationship testing. I mean, uh, you know, that's why I was so excited for St. Petersburg. We, we showed up at Sebring the week before and, you know, we were never out of the top three all day. And I think there was 15 cars there. We were the, the fastest Andretti car and, everything was just clicking, you know, that the Indy car has never been that easy for me to drive that day. And, and that's just because him and I really kind of found a place that I really liked and, and he got me there. So, you know, I'm really excited to see what him and I can achieve this year. And, you know, we're just very similar personalities and, you know, that's what it takes to be competitive at this level. So I'm just, I'm excited to see where things go once we get back to racing. Yeah, me too. That sounds awesome. And, and I know, uh, Mark Bryan is is a is a brilliant mind and and helped Pato win that championship. So, Michael Andretti and Mario Andretti, you've you've been around them both for for many years. So, what wisdom on and off the track have they been able to pass along to you? You know, it, it's funny because you know I look at that and I think you know with Michael and Mario, they've helped me in two completely different aspects of my life. So. Michael has always been, um, you know, trying to help me on the track side, you know, he's always had great advice from, 
you know, how to plan for the 500 miles of Indy and how each one of those miles, your race basically changes multiple times and, and how to, uh, you know, find some speed in certain places and, and what to look for in making the car a bit better. And Mario, he's always just been kind of like a wise grandfather. You know, he, him and I have always talked more about life than racing. And, you know, then he'll always crack off about a story of him racing in the rain at Japan and Formula One when Nicky Lauda and James Hunt were going for the championship. And you're just like, whoa, <laughs> like, you know, you were there. It's, just, <laughs> it's crazy. But, you know, Mario has probably given me my best advice I've ever had in my life. And, you know, I think it was 2015 when I was really struggling. Um, you know, my I was working for the two-seater, giving rides. But I, I didn't have an, uh, a proper driving ride at that point. And Mario told me not to give up because he really believed in me. And, and that was the last bit of motivation I needed to, you know, just keep pushing that, that extra little bit. So, you know, I, I really am very, very thankful for Mario to say that. And, you know, that's something that I, I remember every day. Yeah, that's motivating me right now, and I'm sure that was was a few years ago. So, last Andretti question here: Who would be the driver or person on Andretti Autosport most likely to pull a prank on somebody? Uh, I want to say Alex for sure. You know, it's not the typical like ha ha prank. You know, like scaring someone or moving stuff around. Um, it would be, you know like requesting the money via Apple Pay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we make a lot of bets. There's a lot of bets that are made throughout the uh, the truck each race weekend. I think uh, Hunter Ray actually still owes Alex like $200 because there was a bet whether or not we'd be racing at St. Petersburg. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's a lot of stuff like that, you know, to take the edge off. But, yeah, Alex would probably be the one, you know, forthcoming or something like that. And then probably Marco's next in line because, uh, you know, he likes to have fun too. So I love it. And Ryan, if you're listening or Alex, if you're listening, I have nothing to do with the payment of that money, but I do know what's going <laughs> on now. So we'll switch <laughs> yeah, gears exactly. slightly here. Uh, this question comes is, is a usual host Jess question. If you had to pick three guests at a dinner party, whether they're still alive or not, who would they be? Okay. That's, See, I like these questions because they're, you know, they're fun because they get you thinking. And, you know, for me, the, the, the first person I would love to have there is uh, a guy named Yvonne Chouinard. You know, anyone that's, uh, you know, familiar with the outdoors, they, they've heard his name. And he's the uh, founder of Patagonia, the clothing company. And, you know, he fell into that by accident. You know, Yvonne was basically the AJ Foyt of climbing in the 60s. He was a blacksmith. He made his own climbing gear to make things easier. Um, he saw, uh, you know, he saw part of the world and part of the market that didn't exist. And it's not that he built Patagonia to be successful. He just wanted better things to take into the wilderness. So he's a guy that I would just love to talk about the golden age of rock climbing with. Um, secondly, it would be Paul McCartney, just because I'm a huge Beatles fan. You know, just, just talking about, you know, all the different songs that they have. You know, that's something I really appreciate about the, uh, the Beatles is, you know, there's so many years of their, well, there's not a lot of years, but, you know, there's so many different sounds in their music that, you know, you find something for whatever you're looking for. And a uh, third would be Ayrton Senna. You know, uh, Senna passed away about six years, or sorry, about six months before I was born in 94. So, you know, I wasn't really around per se when he was, you know, doing what he did best, but to be able just to, to, to talk to him, you know, it, it'd be one of those things I've always admired him, you know, from afar, because that's the way it's, it's had to be. But, you know, you just, you have admiration and love for someone uh, that you've never met, but it would be, it'd be great to just have a conversation with him. I love it. Fantastic answer there all around. So the pit lane parlay Spotify driver's choice, if you had to pick an artist or a song, what would it be? Okay. So I'm going to say artist first. The one artist I want everyone to go listen to is called Mount Joy. It's this band that it's just, they're still kind of coming up, but they're going to be huge. They're playing with Lumineers right now. And that's when I discovered them and, and like heard their sound for the first time. And, and they're just, they're an incredible group. So for me, I'm going to say there's three top songs. I'll let you, you know, listen to them and you can pick which one you want in the Spotify playlist. But the first one is Sheep 
Spy Mount Joy. It's a really good one. Uh, the next is Let Loose. It's kind of more of a slow, uh, you know, if you're, you know, feeling some mood. And uh, third is a song called Astro Man. So it's literally about, uh, you know, Jesus driving around in a, an old van. And, you know, that's that's the song we got to play on repeat a lot of the times when we're driving around in our van. So, uh, you know, those are my top three. <laughs> we need the Toastmaster 2500 in the Astro Van music video, I think is what you're getting at. Well, that's what I'm trying. We'll, we'll see what happens. You know, <laughs> once we can leave our house for anything other yeah, than groceries, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll try to make that happen. <laughs> Fair enough here. So this question, the next two questions come from Team Pit Lane members here. The first is from David Lighting, who wants to know, you you took some flying lessons a couple of years ago. Do you think at some point you'll go back to flying lessons once everything kind of goes back to normal? I think so. You know, one day, probably not in the near future. Um, you know, when I get a bit older and, and things slow down, I, I think I would love to get back to flying. I I was flying when I was in uh, Indy Lights, and you know I got about 20 hours in a 172. So I hit the halfway point of, of getting my flying my pilot's license, and you know at that point in lights you're not making any money. Um, you know the only money that you do make is from giving two seater rides, and a lot of the times that's just to barely pay rent and get some food. So um, at that time I kind of got to the point that I wanted. You know I, I felt like okay, I could jump in a 172, and if I had to, I could fly it to where I needed to go and not kill myself in the process. Um, so, you know, once I kind of hit that point and I felt comfortable, you know, you know, taking a, a hunk of metal off a runway and flying it through the air, I, I stopped flying. But, you know, one day I would like to get back and, and finish those last 20 hours and, you know, fly around legally. <laughs> that would be, that'd be great. Um, but, you know, we're a few years from that. I got a van and climbing and motorsports, and I'm trying very hard to balance them all in the, uh, you know, appropriate responsibility ways. <laughs> yeah, totally fair. R- really cool. So the next question is from our pal, uh, Michael Goodyear. He wants to know, so back in 2015, you drove an IMSA prototype challenge car for JDC Miller Motorsports over at Laguna. Did that help you stay competitive in a year where you didn't have a lot of racing going on and kind of stand out versus other drivers before you made the eventual jump to IndyCar? Yeah, I definitely think it helped. You know, for me, at at that point, uh, you know, I had this great season in Indy Lights the year before. Um, you know, we were fighting for the, the championship all the way to the last race of the year, and I had a steering rack break when I was like two points out of the lead of the championship, and that basically set my fate, you know, and you know, I, was, I was pretty upset because I thought I lost my, my opportunity to get the IndyCar, and you know, 2015 came around. At that point, I actually had a contract set for me to drive for Andretti Autosport, and then the sponsor backed out uh, about a month before St. Petersburg. So I was kind of in this tough place. I, I didn't know if IndyCar was going to still happen at that point, if I ever had the opportunity. So I was scrambling to try to figure out where or what direction I needed to take my career in that, at that point. And, you know, I thought give sports cars a try or at least get my feet wet to understand what that environment was like. And luckily, uh, John Church um, from JDC a uh, great guy that I always raced against, but never for um, him and I kind of bumped into each other at Barber and we kind of threw this idea together at the time. I, I didn't realize how badly my hand was broken. <laughs> so I um, had a, a hairline fracture, basically a small fracture on my right wrist when I crashed a lights car in Toronto. And then I raced the rest of 2013 season and all of 14 and my wrist would just hurt every now and then, but it never, you know, got worse and you just took a Tylenol and it was gone and then uh yeah in 2015 I just had a small accident where I put pressure on it in the wrong way and then it just it hurt terribly for uh you know about three weeks so I still was going to do that race so I drove that race with a broken hand my right hand went numb halfway through the race wow. and that's when wow. I started thinking like oof <laughs> like you know we, <laughs> we might have a small problem um but yeah we ended up finishing fourth and then I had surgery a week and a half later and and that put me out for the rest of 2015 but you know it was a great opportunity that led me to uh my probably my one of my single biggest opportunities the following year was driving for Bellardi and Indy Lights 
Brian Bellardi gave me a call and he knew where I was at. You know, I didn't have any money. And since Brian was the guy I lost my championship basically to his team in Indy Lights, uh, he gave me an opportunity to try to, to get one back. And we had such a great year. Um, you know, that's another thing that kills me because, you know, we, we had a mechanical failure at St. Petersburg when I led the first 17 laps. We had like five laps to go. I had like a three second lead and the car shut off. And then we lost some points because uh, we got hit at the Watkins Glen race and it broke a strut. Um, so we, we got penalized for that. And if it wasn't for those two incidents, I think we would have came very close to, to winning the lights championship in 16 as well. So, you know, I, I just wasn't meant to win any lights championship because two mechanical failures basically took me out of those. But, you know, those guys giving me that opportunity led to Carpenter giving me my first IndyCar test which led to Carpenter having me fill in for Hildebrand Barber. And that resume at that point led me to landing my, my sponsor and, and all of this becoming what it is. So, you know, I look back at that, you know, 15 months and that was the most important time of my life so far. I love it. So we'll wrap it up here with one final question. Zach, thanks for the time this afternoon. I, I wholeheartedly appreciate it. Texas and maybe the first you know, who knows how many races it might be most of the season will be run without fans. Is that going to be tough to adjust to kind of how quiet it is around the track? Or is it more of a, listen, we're just happy to be racing and, and you know, people will watch on TV and, and get their, their racing fill? You know, it's going to be weird, um, you know, for sure. Because at the end of the day, I'm, I'm thankful that we can get back on track and we can put on some sort of show. You know, uh, especially, you know, for those who are at home watching on TV that I'm glad that we can fill some kind of entertainment void that we just don't have right now. And and selfishly, so I can get back in a race car and actually get back to doing the one thing that, you know, makes life worth living. Right. You know, for us, this is this has for been sure. the longest any of us have gone without racing since we started, basically. But, you know, I, I it is going to be weird. You know, it's going to feel like one giant practice day with a practice race in it that magically counts you know it's it's going to be different but you know I think the fans are such a big part of free grace you know you do your intros and, and you see the people there and you're excited because they're excited uh, I'm going to miss seeing the people waiting outside my garage uh, you know in the paddocks that's such a big part I look forward to every weekend because you know those people are there because they're excited to see you like how cool is that and now, you know, we're, we're not going to have that for a little bit. So I'm sad because of that, but at the end of the day, I am happy that we're getting back to it. It's just, you know, it's like eating your vegetables right now. It's, it's not exactly the, what you want, but you know, you do it now and we can finally get back to enjoying the way it was later on. I think that might be the best metaphor in a <laughs> racing conversation I've ever heard. <laughs> Well, I try, you know, I'm still like 14 at heart, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't disagree. And I think that's what makes it even better. But Zach, I, I do appreciate the time this afternoon. Stay safe and, and enjoy working on the van and uh, look forward to seeing you at the racetrack when, whenever that may be. And good luck throughout 2020. Yeah, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate having me on. It was uh, great to talk to you and feel like I'm uh, a race car driver again because, uh, <laughs> It's been it's been a bit weird just being in my basement playing eye racing and uh, mowing my grass occasionally. So, so thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I I appreciate the time and and that's pretty much where I'm headed to right as soon as we're done recording here. So, Zach, have a good well, rest good of your yeah <laughs> yeah. I'll uh, I'll pretend I'm a race car driver with my my mower. Although I'm sure my neighbors will think I'm nuts. Perfect. That's that's what they're there for. <laughs> well, sir. <laughs> Have a good afternoon, and uh, I look forward to talking to you again. All right. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks a lot.